sometimes it sometimes it might be um, difficult, more difficult than you think, because in fact the the, the situation when you don't have enough information uh, about the program on the official website might mean that it's pretty hard to determine your eligibility. Pretty hard to understand if you're the right sort of applicant for this program. Um, I, I think well, Sarah is going to talk about this in, uh, in greater detail because um, the main thing with this program is that it is highly restrictive. And perhaps you guys, when you looked at our um, requirements to register for this webinar, you could see that we were asking you difficult questions as to whether you're a PhD graduate or not, as to whether you've worked in target sectors, um, as to whether you did research in target sectors, and um, as, to you, um, as to whether you held um, high profile roles in businesses, as to whether you were offered high salaries. So uh, this, this, uh, this mix of question that questions that we had for the participants of this event was, was not to just, <laughs> was not just, was not to scare you off, um, but it's uh, to give you some um, rough idea of, of the criteria of this program and of the requirements of this program that unfortunately the program is not for everyone, right? So I, um, we have many uh, pathways to Australia. We have different uh, options of getting Australian visas. Um, but this particular program is uh, for, for the brightest and most talented individuals in some sectors, but not at, in other sectors. Yeah, so, so that's an important point to make. And apart from those individuals, we also have a separate category of uh, PhD graduates. There used to be both masters by research graduates and PhD graduates, but I think Sarah will talk more about it as the program has evolved. The department has decided to focus on uh, PhD graduates only and, uh, and not on masters by research graduates. And also the department um, has brought their focus to individuals that are um, closer to their completion of their dissertation, if not completed. Yeah, at the same time, the program is not only for scientists, of course it's not, it's, uh, it's also for high profile um, business people in the target sector sectors. So you might have um, only a diploma in formal, um, education, but you might have developed um, a startup uh, blockchain that has attracted media attention from all over the world and you're um, interviewed by, uh, by the press and we can uh, see your name in open sources. And uh, we are pretty impressed when we, when you, we go to your LinkedIn profile. So um, there are so many, um, so many things uh, we are looking at when, when we decide whether you're the right person for the program. And I, I think that Sarah has joined us. Um, is that right? Hi, Sarah. Good morning. Hi, everyone. Uh, okay, so Sarah, I'm going to um, I'm going to do a bit of uh, uh, housekeeping. So thank you for joining us, Sarah Rose, first secretary of Home Affairs, Global Talent Task Force, Europe and Israel, Australian High Commission in London. Thank you very much for joining right. us. And and uh, um, although um, Sarah is responsible for, uh, although your title is Europe and Israel, you're basically responsible for all European countries, pretty much. Um, but I also think that individuals uh, who have registered from non-European countries can also learn a lot um, about this event. It's just that perhaps their applications will be will be coming to other task forces, but the criteria for assessment will be the same. And so it might be helpful. And uh, so Sarah is, um, is uh, speaking to us here in, in London and here in Adelaide office 
of Oz's group. Uh, it's me, Kostya Kuzmin, registered migration agent and PhD candidate in law. So not in the target sector. If I were planning um, to migrate in this program, I wouldn't be able to do it. Um, um, Sarah is going to talk more about the target sector soon. Um, I, we have planned the event in the, in the following uh, way. We're going to, to do a small intro, which we have already done. Uh, we're going to talk about the requirements of the program. Sarah is going to talk to describe the requirements of the program. Then um, I'm going to take a bit of your precious time by um, shooting three questions at you that uh, applicants ask me all the time three pervasive questions um, I would like to have answers uh, for. I, I can guess what the answers are, but Sarah, your, your input would be very much appreciated. And then we can talk to the most active participants because um, even prior to the seminar, um, I have already been contacted by LinkedIn, uh, in LinkedIn by people who have some questions. So, uh, which is amazing. Um, Sarah, Please, please tell us the thing you, you have been telling to people for at least the last two years, I assume. What, what is the program about and who is it designed for? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. Hello to everyone. Uh, so the Global Talent Program is a, an initiative that the Australian government started a couple of years ago and uh, pre-COVID actually. And since COVID hit, we have kind of ramped up that effort. So Australia is seeking uh, exceptionally talented individuals who want to succeed and make a difference. We've got uh, 10 target sectors that we're working with and I'll list those off for you. It's resources agri-food and agri-tech, energy, health industries, defence, advanced manufacturing and space, circular economy, digitech, infrastructure and tourism, financial services and fintech, and education. So uh, that's a pretty broad brush of different sectors, but effectively we're looking for people who can grow those sectors and really contribute to making them the future industries for Australia. We have, as a government, worked closely with industry to determine that those are our future facing industries. And really we're looking at all of them from a, a tech or innovation perspective. So uh, this visa program specifically is looking for individuals who are at the top of their field, who are experienced, who have these innovative ideas and expertise, that they can uh, bring those skills to Australia and help grow our economy and specifically foster the ecosystems around each of those sectors. Um, we are doing a really big push, hence uh, I am based in London, as you said, looking after the European region. Uh, and I have a number of colleagues who are based around the world looking after different regions. We all perform the same function. So it's really just about dealing with the, the global talent officer um, that's within your region just to simply make it easier. Um, but we are here to work with potential candidates um, to share the message of what the program is and then look at people and work with them to give them an indication of whether this program might be a good fit for them. Um, it's important to recognise that uh, I don't make the decisions um, and that's quite deliberate. Myself and, and the others in the Global Talent Network, we are here to kind of answer some general questions to kind of give people a bit of a steer if they, they might be eligible. Um, but it's, it's a different processing team back in Australia that actually assesses the applications and makes the decision. So um, I'll put that out there first. Uh, in terms of the eligibility requirements for the visa, people need to be able to show that they are rec uh, internationally recognised for whatever it is that their you know, core skill set is, whatever it is that their, their specialty is. Um, they need to be prominent in their field of expertise. They need to be able to provide evidence that they would be um, of benefit to the Australian community. So how are they going to help contribute to our ecosystems and grow them? Um, they also need to provide evidence that they would have no difficulty obtaining employment in Australia. So this is a little bit different to our other skilled visa programs where you have to have a job secured before you can come to Australia for the most part. Um, this one, you don't need to have a job um, secured. You don't need to be sponsored by an employer, but you need to be able to show that you will be able to be employed when you're in Australia. You need to also... 
Um, while you don't have to be sponsored by your employer, you do need to have someone that can nominate you. Uh, and this is an important part of this process because we are, you know, inviting people who are in these specialized skill sets. Um, and we need to have someone that can kind of vouch for that skill set because you don't need that, that employer sponsor. So the nominator needs to be either an Australian organization um, or an Australian person, um, whether that's a permanent resident or a citizen who is in the same field as you and can talk to your expertise. So they need to be recognized um, nationally within Australia. So they need to have a, a, a national reputation um, and they need to be able to say, yes, this person one is who they say they are, their skill set is, is um, what they said it is, and yes, that would be of benefit to the Australian um, economy. So that can th those nominators can be a little bit tricky for some people if they don't have a, a huge amount of contacts in Australia and also just pitching them at the right level. So um, the Global Talent Officers, we don't find nominators for you, but we can certainly kind of have some discussions about, you know, if you come forward with some options, whether those people might be appropriate or um, whether we need to look, look at other options. One sort of example of that is certainly people in the financial services and fintech industry. Um, you know, uh, an accountant, an account manager, um, those types of people aren't going to be sufficient to be your nominator. We'd be looking for, you know, senior people within the finance industry. So just kind of keeping in mind that they need to be relatively senior as well. And then the last uh, requirement is the high income threshold. So Australia has a fair work high income threshold that every year within line with our, our taxation system gets increased. And so for this program year, which is until 30 June 2022, um, the income threshold is 158,500 Australian dollars. So uh, candidates need to show that they either currently earn that much money or that they would be able to earn that much money in the near future. Um, for some people in some industries, that's, you know, that's really easy to do. For other people, it's perhaps, you know, in an industry where that's not, not a, a wage that is given. So there is a little bit of flexibility there, but it really is about candidates working with their migration agents and being able to kind of explain what their situation is and why, um, why it might not quite meet that threshold. So that's, that's the, um, the high level, I guess, uh, requirements for the visa. Um, as I said, we're looking for people in those 10 target sectors um, who can come and contribute. What we're finding is uh, there's no kind of standard candidate. Everyone has a slightly different story. Everyone has a slightly different experience level. So when we're looking at things like um, how you prove that you have international recognition of what you do. Um, for some people, you know, if you're in academia, uh, that might be that you've published multiple journal articles, you know, that you've got um, lots of citations of your research. Um, some people might have patents that they've done. For others in other industries, it might be that you're, you're often asked to be a keynote speaker at um, some sort of international conference. It might be for some people, they've been in you know, things like the Forbes 40 under 40, that type, type of list, any type of international recognition, but it needs to make sense to what it is that your experience is and what you've done. For others, it might be that they've worked on international projects um, and it might not necessarily have media coverage, but well-known within the industry what that person has achieved. So uh, I think we're previously um, a lot of visa programs, Australia, but also overseas, you know, it's really black and white criteria. It's really clear. You either sort of meet the criteria or you don't. Um, the benefit of this visa program is that there's recognition that people have different pathways, people have different skill sets, and not everyone is going to have the same, uh, I guess, evidence to back up what it is they've done. So it's really on the candidate working with their migration agent to be able to put forward what it is about this person that's so special and, and why they meet this criteria. Now, of course, there'll be some people who have fantastic skill sets, but who aren't quite at the threshold required for this visa program. And um, Australia is definitely still interested in having those people, but we would be recommending that they pursue our, our standard visa programs. Great, thank you, Sarah. Um, I have so many questions that I want to ask. Mm -hmm. while, I, while I was listening, my three have grown into more um, and, uh, and all the applicants will be able uh, to, answer, to ask their questions in the end. You know, um, 
thank you. This was um, a wonderful presentation. Um, first thing that was in my mind was the nominator, okay? We now know uh, that, for instance, if you're in FinTech or tech, you could be nominated by your university professor. You could be, if they are nationally famous, uh, and they will most likely be, um, you could be nominated by Australian Computer Society. Similarly, I think the and Engineers Australia in some of the target sectors now has the power to nominate people. So I, does it make any difference for the person who looks at your EOI, the person in that team that you have spoken about in Australia, when they look in your EOI, is it when you are nominated by ACS or Engineers Australia, is it easier for them to say that well, yes, I find the nominator reliable than a university professor, than someone in the, in the industry. Because to me, as a registered migration agent, if I think in legal terms, to me, um, I would first have to define whether that person is nationally recognized. And this, this is where I would have to go to Google search, to university websites, to other places to look at their publications. I would have to, to go into some subjective assessment to to find out if the nominator is famous enough, right? With ACS or with Engineers Australia, I wouldn't have this difficulty as a decision maker. Would you say that's true or, or I'm not? Um, it's kind of an interesting one because, you know, you're right in terms of that national reputation, but where uh, it sometimes can be a little bit complicated is, for example, we use some of those bodies. Um, they don't personally know the candidate. So therefore their reference will never be as strong as someone that, you know, you have a professional relationship with prior to this process. So whether it's a university professor, whether it's someone that you had worked with on an international project that now works at, you know, one of Australia's leading financial institutions, um, they have a, a personal and, um, you know, longer history with the candidate. And so from, from our perspective, um, yes, it, it might take a little bit more work to, to check that person's inter uh, national reputation and their standing, but that relationship is uh, more solid. Whereas if you're using these um, industry bodies, particularly the ones where you're sort of paying for a service, um, you know, they don't have a pre-existing relationship with you. Um, we would need to really be digging into that to check the valid validity of that. So um, I know there's been some sort of rumours, so to speak, going around, you know, kind of the, the global talent community, which suggests that certain people or organisations have been approved as a nominator. Um, every single nomination is looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. So just because the nominator, whether it's a person or an organisation, you know, was successful with another candidate doesn't mean they will be with the next candidate because it's looking at that relationship. Um, what is that nominator's ability to speak to this person's experience? You know, how much research have they done if they didn't already know them? Um, what, what kind of is underpinning this recommendation? So it's so uh, it's I guess the answer is no. It's not necessarily better to to use one of those um, agencies. Okay. Well, thank you for that because my my logic was stereotypical. I I thought this would be a safer way. You know. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um. Uh, I think you answered one of my questions by saying um, um media profile may or may not be necessary. I still will um ask this question again. Media, your media profile and your LinkedIn. And I think the EOI asks for your LinkedIn link, right? So is Global Talent a program where you look for people with a certain level of publicity still? How, how important is this publicity? So would that mean that, um, let's say, um, if you're in blockchain, you've developed a new cryptocurrency, which is gaining popularity, right? We all, we all think that they are speculative, but they are in our uh, global talent visa program, the blockchain te technology is there. So would we be looking at the founder who's pitched the project and is everywhere? Would we be looking uh, um, at a person in, in the marketing team 
uh, just because they are famous and they're known to talk to the press all the time and then they, they might be in press releases and whatever. Um, or would we be looking for the senior developer because they were the one who did all the hard work? Who would we be looking for? And what is the proportion of the media profile and LinkedIn presence and, and online presence to the hard work? How, how does it work? I think that's a really good question. Um, and again, this is a little bit case by case basis. Um, the co-founder of a blockchain technology you know, company, to use your example, we would want them because they would obviously have a skill set which has enabled them to create this blockchain technology and to turn that into whatever business it is. So um, their media profile is sort of neither here nor there it's the skill set that they have some of those people will naturally have a big media profile and you know a linkedin profile and all of that sort of thing but we have had people come through the program who don't have any public um really public profile they might be quite private maybe their work they're doing they don't want it to have out there so again this is about looking at what best suits your particular circumstances um, I think the, the marketing person is a really good question. For the most part, we would probably say no, that person is not for this program um, because generally, you know, marketing people, while they perform a really critical role, um, that's not necessarily an exceptional talent. You know, can you, yes, you might do a great job at whatever it is you're marketing, but uh, if you were taken from that role, could someone else just as easily sort of do what you do. Um, so there will, of course, be some exceptions. Um, I think a good example, just to kind of digress a little bit, is we have had a lawyer come through the program and generally we would say lawyers aren't for this program, but this particular lawyer specialises in fintech. Oh, wow. Um, and helping fintech startups. So, so an average lawyer, while a very well-respected career and, and you know, um, well-paid and all of that sort of thing, um, an average lawyer wouldn't get through this program, but this person was able to say why their skill set was so unique and why it was so critical to the fintech industry. So it would be the same for a lot of those enabling type of roles. So your average marketing person is not going to get through, um, but if they were able to show why they are so critical to, you know, one of these industries, then perhaps we would consider them. Um, we ask for people's LinkedIn profile because most people these days have a LinkedIn profile um, and it's a good way to kind of validate things that um, they're sort of putting forward in their profile, in their expression of interest. If you don't have a LinkedIn profile, that's not a concern. Um, as I said, we've had people that sort of don't have any public profiles, but it just means that they will need to have uh, provided a, another alternative for how they show that they're internationally recognized. Thank you very much for that. I see that uh, uh, questions are starting to pop up, but I still finish with mine. We still are within the mm -hmm. time. Don't worry, everyone. You will not leave this event with your questions unanswered. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Uh, Sarah, my next question is um, a lot of people come to this office and tell me I've worked in a famous company. I've worked in several famous employers. Uh, a lot of people at link their, the type of business they worked in, the brand name of the business they worked for, and especially their salary. So most of the people think, a combination of a good company name and a good salary. Good salary in the past would mean that they would earn that income in Australia in the past, and a famous company means that they were good enough to be employed there. Well, what would your response to that be? Yeah, look, I think that is an indicator. I think those things alone won't get you across the line, but that's definitely an indicator. Um, you know, I think Google is a really good example, right? Like everybody around the world knows it's very competitive to get into Google. So um, they're a huge company, they're worldwide, they do some really exciting things. But even Google has executive assistants, account managers, you know, um, IT help desk people. So people doing those roles aren't going to be suitable for this program despite the fact that they work at Google and they might get paid, you know, a couple of hundred thousand dollars. So um, it's not, 
yeah, it's not the be all and end all. It's an indicator, um, but you would still need to show what is your skill set. If um, you know you're telling me that uh, you work on Google SpaceX and you're one of the engineers doing that, well, then that's a different story. But if you're sort of the person in Google who really important job, but you're an IT help desk person, um, you're probably not going to be suitable for this program. So as I can understand, this is because we are looking for income multipliers. And if you're an executive, even despite you're very good at what you're doing, you're not an income multiplier. So this is this economic. Yeah, story. yeah. So we're looking for exceptional talent. So again, it goes back to that, you know, um, I think of it in the lens of how, how easily could I be replaced? Um, not to say that your workplace wouldn't miss you. I like to think, um, you know, if I left my job tomorrow that, you know, for for at least a few days, people might miss me, um, but they would be able to get someone else to fill my role and, and be successful. Um, you know, the, the level of people that we're sort of chasing here are those sort of, um, I guess the gems, the people that have some sort of experience, expertise, whatever it might be, that's not common. They are at the top of their field. Um, you know, they're being headhunted because of what it is that they can bring that others can't. Thank you for that. Uh, my last question before we go to people's questions, because there are a lot of questions uh, already accumulated, I, I can see. Um, my last question is about PhDs, because that's one of our target sectors, aren't they? Um, now, an Australian PhD student versus an international PhD student, it, when I say international, I mean, um, it means having completed their studies overseas, say mm -hmm. a, a graduate from Russia, a graduate PhD graduate from Iran in the target sector. Um, how do they compare? And um, what is international recognition for them? We have same strict requirements for them in the target sector. Do they need to have publications? If international, then in how many countries? And how do you measure them? Because it's complex, you know, being a PhD student myself, I, I see that, you know, out of the three or four years that you study, you actually pump, pump, uh, pump out your publications in the third or the fourth year. And uh, the, it, it's your first effort. So you will not, you will very unlikely get to top rated journals if, if it's your first, second or third publication. You know, it's a steep learning curve. So is it that strict? And what is it like for overseas graduates, PhD graduates versus Australian PhD graduates? Yeah, another great question. Um, for, for the PhD candidates, uh, we will look at sort of the quality of your school. So, you know, there are definitive rankings of, that, that get released every year that sort of put out um, the rankings of different universities around the world. So, you know, um, a university that's in perhaps the top 50 or top 100 globally is going to be, uh, if you have a PhD from there, is going to be treated differently to, you know, a university that's maybe ranked a thousand. So, I mean, I think that that would probably be fairly obvious. It doesn't necessarily have to be an Australian university. Um, you know, there's some obviously some brilliant universities around the world um, in all different regions. Um, PhD candidates, we have tightened up the requirements. So when this program first started, um, some of you might be aware it was actually open to PhD candidates as well as master's candidates. And so we have tightened that up over the time because this program has been quite popular. And so, you know, we are trying to sort of increase the threshold. So basically for PhD candidates to be successful, they would need to be able to show that the research that they have done has been cutting edge. Um, that it is contributing to one of our target sectors. Um, we would look at any patents they have, citations on, on their work. Um, I understand what you're saying, you know, they might, might not have been out long enough to do that. So there might be some people where, um, look, you're on the pathway, but you're not quite there yet um, because this is for people who, who are already exceptional. Um, we are trying to identify sort of people on their way up. But, uh, but there is a limit. So it, it is a little bit difficult to give a definitive kind of response, I guess, for the PhD candidates, other than to say um, either your research needs to have been cutting edge and so therefore sort of fits our criteria, or um, it's a combination of work that maybe you have done before you've done your PhD or while you're doing your PhD. Um, 
or the PhD to fit within the PhD stream it's if you've finished your PhD within the last three years. So over that span of time, some people might have that combination of here's the, you know, cutting edge work I did as part of my PhD, here's where I've applied it in the workplace. And uh, we find that, you know, I made some comments before about the income threshold. Um, we do find that PhD candidates are the ones who kind of most likely struggle with meeting that threshold because um, we appreciate that in research, you know, you're not getting huge salaries. And so that's something that we have worked with some candidates and they're able to sort of show, um, while yes, I'm, I'm studying and, you know, maybe I'm doing some part-time teaching on the side, um, this is the income I get. But, you know, within two years, people who graduate with a similar PhD to me would earn X, Y, and Z. Thank you for that, Sarah. We're flooded with questions. So enough of my questions, let's go to people's questions. Hi, does the department, some of them are direct messages, so I will be just reading them out, mm -hmm. okay? Hi, does the department prioritize according to someone's nationality and does it prioritize applications on target sectors that are aligned with PMSOL skills list? Uh, no. So there's no prioritization based on nationality at all. Um, and uh, this is separate to the priority migration list. So um, although those occupations for our other visas are being prioritized for this one, they're not. We do have an ability to prioritize limited numbers of applications through this program. Um, it is really on an exception basis. And it is where that person, when they've put forward their expression of interest, they have been able to demonstrate that they are unbelievably exceptional you know so we're going to have people who are absolutely eligible for this program and who will be invited to apply for the visa um, and they will sort of go through the standard process and you know we'll get to your application as soon as we can and then there are people who are obviously exceptional um, and they will sort of potentially get prioritized thank you also why process times uh vary from person to person and how one updates their EOI, the question reads. Yeah, um, this happens across all of our visas. So every single visa application is considered on a case by case basis. And there are a number of things that can make uh, applications take longer than others. Um, some of them will be associated with your nationality in that perhaps it takes longer for you to get a police check. So it's not about we are prioritizing one nationality over the other. It's about you know, do you need to get a police check from a certain country and do those countries take longer to do that? Do you need to get health checks in another country and that takes longer? Um, with the expression of interest process, we need to verify information you've put forward, perhaps who we need to verify it with takes longer to get back to us than, you know, in other places. So it, it is all done on an individual basis. Um, and I appreciate that can be a, a little bit frustrating to people, but we are kind of pushing them through as quickly as we can. Um, there has been a significant amount of interest from this program, which is excellent. The other thing that's happened, though, is because it is an expression of interest and the expression of interest doesn't cost any money, um, a lot of people that um, aren't eligible are applying and we have to go through every single one of those applications, assess them and, uh, and you know, get back to that person. So that takes time, even though it's pretty clear that those people might not be eligible. So, so we are kind of being flooded with all this interest. And I think I might've missed the second part of that question. Um, yeah, how, how does one update their EOI? Okay, so there is um, a mailbox. So when you submit your EOI, you should get a notification and it's um, global talent at homeaffairs.gov.au. Um, that's the, the inbox. And so you would need to send an email to them with your, um, probably your passport number is the best way to do it. Um, and say, can you please add this information to my expression of interest? They will receive that. They will add it to your file. Um, they won't respond because we're getting flooded with so many emails. So it, it's likely you, you will just get an auto response um, that sort of says, thank you for your email. You know, here's some basic information, frequently asked questions, but your email will get added to your file. Thank you, Sarah. Next question. I'm from India. As I understand, Sarah handles Europe. So who would be the right person for me to talk to? Yeah, so we have um, a team that looks after India. 
Um, on our website, we've got a contact us page and it's got the email addresses for all the different regions. Um, I'm just opening it while we speak and I'll, I'll tell you the one for, um, it's Global Talent South Asia, all kind of one word, Global Talent South Asia at homeaffairs.gov.au. Um, so if you go to our website, as I said, there's when you get to the Global Talent Visa Program page, there is a, a link to contact us and then it lists all the mailboxes. And so you should contact the team that's in your region. Yeah, and, and just an addition uh, uh, to, to answer uh, this question. And perhaps you may consider contacting Aussie's group, which has offices in India, as well as over Australia and hundreds of staff who can help you. Uh, because some applicants um, require help with understanding if they're eligible for the program or not. And if everyone goes to Sarah, as Sarah said, not only Sarah, but any, any staff member of the department can be uh, flooded easily with emails and questions. Uh, so we would be happy to help you with your eligibility for the program and for the visa. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think um, it's probably important to note for people, uh, you know, this is definitely the benefit of having a migration agent. A migration agent can talk to you about your suitability for this program and whether there are other visa options that might be more appropriate for your circumstances. That's something that we cannot do. That That's not a service that we provide um, as representatives of the government. We can't give you migration advice. So certainly speaking to, to the migration agents is really going to help. Thank you, Sarah. Um, what, same, same person asking the question, what if we don't get anyone to nominate us? What if there is a nominee, but the person is not internationally recognized? So the nominator needs to be recognized in Australia. So they don't need to have international recognition, but they need to within, you know, if they're in um, Digitech, or energy in Australia, you know, these people in the Australian industry would need to sort of be able to recognize them and say, yes, that is a person that, you know, has some authority and has some expertise in this region, um, in this field. So the nominator is national, Australian national reputation and the candidate, which is you guys, you need to have that international recognition. If you don't have a nominator, then you won't be eligible for the program. So you need to find one. I'm going to now read a big block of questions from the same person. They are related, so I, I, I okay. hope that's going to work. Thank, thank you for that response, Sarah. Um, I'm from health industry. I'm a clinician with passion for healthcare quality, communications, and international relations, focusing my vision on innovation in healthcare through change management and leadership excellence. I have been in healthcare practice for the last 14 years, besides being a healthcare quality and accreditation consultant and change management specialist in healthcare. What could be a possible scenario for me? Telemedicine and telehealth has always been my passion and has been, and I've been working on this for over a decade now. To summarize, I'm a clinician turned healthcare, medical operations and interventions. What would you say? Okay, so, um, I mean, it's a little bit difficult to give, you know, kind of individual advice in a field like this, in a forum like this, but, um, you know, in the health and life sciences field, we're really looking for people who have innovation. And so um, one of the analogies I like to use, because I think everybody can understand this, is um, if we talk about a general practitioner, um, Australia, like many countries, particularly through COVID, um, is always after more health professionals. Um, we desperately need more GPs that can work in regional areas in Australia. So there's a lot of work being done to try and attract, um, attract those types of skill sets. Um, a GP wouldn't be suitable for this program, though. So um, despite that being a, an in-demand skill, despite it being, you know, a really um, reputable career path and, and, you know, held in kind of quite high esteem, um, a GP will not get through on this program because the, it, this is really about innovation, um, about exceptional talent. So from a health and medical perspective, if, if we're using that kind of doctor analogy, we're looking for a surgeon that has some sort of specialist treatment that, you know, is, is not performed widely in the rest of the world, um, that has some sort of innovation on how they might treat people. Um, so keep that in mind. 
uh, in the health industries, we're looking at technology. So, you know, you spoke about innovation and change management. So what is it that you can bring that others can't? Um, telehealth has been a huge thing, but it's not, we're not just looking for people who can use telehealth. We're looking at people who are creating telehealth or, you know, helping telehealth um, be more accessible. So really looking at what your role is within that particular industry and what your skill set is. Thank you, Sarah. Next question. Thanks for your presentation. Could you please share more about the education target sector? What all is uh, covered in this sector? Say, can a PhD graduate in accounting slash economic, economics apply under this sector? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no. Um, so when we're talking about education, we're talking about people who um, have cutting skills cutting edge skills and innovations in the education industry. So are you redefining how we educate people? So some of that is like the digital education. There's a lot of like online learning that's happening at the moment, but less about, oh, I created a, you know, an e-course for you to do, but more about I'm redefining the way that we, you know, teach students, whether it be primary school age, whether it be adults at university. Um, so advanced kind of educational systems and curriculum, um, anything that would improve the educational infrastructure um, and kind of research platforms. Um, we do accept in the education sector, uh, like deans, professors, I think it's, a, I'm not an education expert, but I believe it's um, d and &E, level academics as opposed to kind of assistant professors and those types of things. Um, just having a PhD, which means you've got a really high level of education, doesn't qualify you for this. So if your PhD is in a finance related field, then you would need to be looking at financial services and fintech as the industry. Sarah, what if the, graduate, the PhD graduate in economics has redefined how we teach economics? Would that work? Potentially, yes. So they would need to show that, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. Do you also need to have a good, a good or exceptional English language test score, such as PTE, IELTS, TOEFL, to apply for GTI? Or do they get priority if you have an exceptional score? Um, so you'll need to show that you can speak a certain level of English. So for some people that is met if they have, um, you know, completed education in an English language university, whether that's in Australia or around the world. Um, otherwise, there are some uh, requirements to do the, the IELTS test and that sort of thing. Um, my understanding is no, there's not a, you know, a priority or, a, or a, um, any benefit to having an exceptional score, there's a threshold and you, you have to meet that threshold, um, whether you're kind of one point above or, or you know, 15 points above is, is not a concern. Yeah, I think it's functional English 4.5 or, or studies in English as a substitute yeah. for functional English IELTS. Right, so uh, basically all the people who can hear and understand at least 50% of what we're saying and able to respond and ask questions would be above the functional English level, obviously. Okay, um, I applied for GTI in January. At that time, I was holding master degree and was eligible to apply. But after 15 days, GTI changed it to only PhD people. I waited for long and got a response from your GTI team asking, it's a quote, the response was asking whether I have a PhD. When I uh, said no, they said, okay, they will contact. As I'm holding strong international recognitions and exceptional talents, could you please advise on what I need to do? I'm waiting for 10 months with no feedback. Please advise. Yeah, so um, I guess there's two things. I mentioned previously that we had been accepting master's students. That was on the basis of their master's qualification only, not really looking at their work history. So if we have people who have like exceptional skills and experience through their work history, who also have a master's degree, um, then that's the pathway that we're sort of looking for. People who um, were applying solely on the basis of their master's degree without that kind of work experience, they have had a response given to them telling them that they're no longer eligible because the, the criteria 
changed. Um, so without sort of, again, going into specifics on a particular candidate without knowing all the information, um, the fact that your application is still current, your EOI is still being processed, suggests to me that you haven't been um, discounted because of just being a master's student. The best thing you can do um, is email the, that global talent mailbox I gave before, globaltalent at homeaffairs.gov.au. Um, and they can, you know, consider whatever your questions are and, and get back to you. Like I said, they are inundated constantly with, with um, queries. So, you know, you would have to be very clear about what it is you wanted to know um, and be patient, I guess, and wait for a response. But because of COVID, I, I sort of mentioned we've been influx, had an influx of people who are interested in this. And because of COVID, you know, we haven't had um, quite as many resources available to process these as, as we would have liked. So there has been a bit of a delay. And you know what? I would just uh, want, I just wanted to make a, a small comment to justify my existence. Um, I'm, I've, I'm very often approached by applicants who have already um, submitted their EOIs. And as at the same time, I'm approached by applicants who haven't done so, I can see that most of the applicants either do not the, have the claims to be a global talent or do have the claims to, to, to be global talent, but from, from your discussion with them and by looking at what they have submitted, you realize that they might have erroneously described their skills. Most people do that by supplying tons of information about themselves. I've seen, you know, I've seen people want to submit 30 pages of CVs with all their publications and depth strokes and whatever. And I, you know, the question I ask them is, uh, would you ever believe anyone who receives hundreds of emails a day potentially would have the time to read it? And it, it's this stage when you can't help the applicant because if, if you try to follow up with the global talent team, you would normally get a response. Look, it's been submitted. We're not going to assist you until a decision is made. And this is where I always tell the applicants, you know, you should think it seems simple um, as if you apply and it's done, but most people cannot, even if they are global talent, find it difficult to communicate their global talent. And once they have submitted this EOI and then they come to us, unfortunately, unless and until they are refused, there's nothing we can do. Yeah, that's true. And um, and a tip that I try and give to people is you've got to think about this as though it's a job application. And, um, you know, some of you work in really cutting edge technology. And um, and as, as you sort of said, you know, it, it can be difficult to explain that to people who, who aren't in the same field as you. And I think people have to keep that in mind. Um, you know, our teams that do these assessments have been doing them a long time and, are, are, you know, conducting a huge amount of research. But they haven't got a PhD, they haven't got the same experience as you. So of course, they're not going to be able to understand all of the technical detail that people give. So um, when preparing your expression of interest, I like to tell people, think about it like a job application, include some sort of cover document, letter, whatever it might be that sort of tells the story of, of who you are and why you're exceptional and why Australia should want you, and then back it up with all the evidence that you need to submit. Um, you don't need to submit, you know, um, pages and pages of really technical information, but, you know, maybe you submit, um, this is the, the, the title of the journal article, and this is how many times it's been cited, and this is the publication it was in, and um, that sort of level of detail. Um, you don't need to submit your whole PhD, um, you know, your thesis. Uh, we're not, we're not going to be able to read that. So yeah, I think you're right. Um, really thinking about what is this package that I'm put, putting forward and how does it best sell my skill set? Our team will absolutely go through everything that's provided, but um, you know, the easier you make it for the decision maker, potentially the quicker you will you will get a decision when they're looking at your case. That that's what I keep telling people. And the problem is, once they have already flooded their decision maker to the extent that they can't quickly and expediously decide whether this application is worth being selected, it's all done. Then you're stuck for twelve months waiting. So you know, I I urge people to to think twice. Potentially talk to to a 
to a registered migration agent or to a legal practitioner who knows the program before before they do it because most of most of the talents even if they're talents they just uh, flood officers with information so officers do not have the mental capacity to work with that amount of information and and to find what is the crux you know Okay, we have another question. Uh, hi, is basic eligibility, does it cover just offers or requires to have offer letter with 149K? It's 159 and in network and security domain. So in other words, do you need a, a, a job offer for, for that? Um, you don't have to have one. It certainly helps if you do, but you don't have to have one. I've seen people that can kind of say, look, this is what I'm doing at the moment in my home country or wherever you currently are. Um, this is what my salary is here. Um, I've been on seek.com, which is, you know, a big recruitment uh, uh, website in Australia. And here are three or four jobs that are similar to what I've been doing. And here is what they're offering. Um, you know, so there's different ways you can provide it. You don't have to have a letter of offer. You don't have to have a contract. Um, but you need to sort of be able to justify why it is that you think you can apply for that. Um, you know, we also look at, um, if I go back to the doctor's analogy, if, if you telling us you're a nurse and then you put forward a, um, a recruitment for a, for a GP, we're going to realise that um, that's not a job that you're realistically going to be able to get. And so same, you know, within Digitech, what are the jobs that are realistic compared to your experience and your skill set? Thank you, Sarah. Next question, what happens if you have worked in two different sectors, such as mining and energy, and have publications in both of them, but say your PhD's major project was energy, but the nominator is internationally recognized in mining? Wow. <laughs> That's a little bit confusing, isn't it? It sounds like you've got some great experience. Um, if your nominator is in mining and you have, therefore, that would suggest that you're putting forward that your experience, your key experience is in the mining industry, then you would go with that. Um, we uh, we can see, we often do have people that kind of cross over too, so we can see that. Um, again, if you do it in sort of the structure that I mentioned, which is some sort of cover letter, you might say in there, look, um, this is what my studies are in that has morphed into working in the energy sector, but I'm actually a specialist in, you know, mining technology or whatever it might be. Um, so you can put that story forward to us, but you just pick the sector that most closely aligns with, I guess, what the, the information packages you're putting forward. So yeah, if your um, if your nominators in mining, if your job is in mining, but your education was in engineering, for example, you would put mining. Thank you, Sarah. Another question, why applications are still hanging on October 2020, though my EOI has been launched in December 2020 for almost one year optimistically will will some will be there be good progress in the near future yeah look we are working really hard to get through them um, I've mentioned a couple of times we've had a huge influx of interest which has been really exciting but it has also coincided with COVID. Um, I'm sure people are, are hopefully semi-aware. We've had a number of lockdowns in Australia in the last few months, um, and that has meant that our workforce has had to uh, to work remotely. Um, unfortunately, government isn't as efficient as some private industry, and so that has you know slowed down our systems and processes and um, our our access to resources of staff. So. Uh, you know, all we can do is thank everyone for being so patient and, and just reiterate that we are working through these as quickly as we can. Um, and, and I know there's been a, a fair bit of recruitment activity happening to bring the, the size of the team up and, and get through these as quickly as possible. Thank you, Sarah. PhD in Agriculture and Dean of Research falls uh, in sector agri-food as well as circular economy in emissions, sustainable production. Which sector should I put in? Wow. Yeah, wow. Really some really impressive people. So again, it, it's kind of a decision for you. Um, just think about yeah, where maybe your nominator is coming from, what sort of roles you think that you will be doing or you have most recently been doing and uh, just explaining somehow through your um, expression of interest that look, I cut across multiple industries. This is why I've put myself against this one, but you know, I could fall within any sector. Thank you. 
Hi, thanks for the presentation. What about if someone selected the wrong sector? Is uh, Will the officer move the candidate to the correct other sector? Thank you. Yeah, look, we're pretty um, flexible with those because, you know, as we've just gone through, we've got a number of people that kind of straddle multiple sectors. So our team will look at what you've put forward. Um, it certainly won't be, you know, if you put forward one and actually we think you're better in the other, you you wouldn't get a refusal just based on having selected the wrong sector. Um, so you can always, again, follow up with an email if you sort of want to clarify, but the team are pretty good at, at realising that definitions of sectors, you know, what we might define as circular economy, other people don't. So, you know, we're pretty good at recognising where people best fit. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I will join the next two messenger, messages together. The I think the first one is uh, about from the person who spoke about having applied with her master's before the, the PhD requirement mm -hmm. was there. Uh, and the second is a new one, um, but also refers to that question. As I'm fulfilling all other criteria other than PhD, did I need to wait for GTI team to respond again, please advise? And another person saying similar thing. I applied when there was a requirement of masters. Uh, I was in the mid of my PhD then, but till then I received uh, no response at all. Yeah, so um, it's not a minimum requirement. So we have people who have come through the program who don't have a masters, who don't have a PhD. It was just that there was a stream where you could apply solely on the basis of your masters. Um, qualification if your master's was in one of these related sectors. So, um, and now the, it's the same with the PhD. Some people are applying solely on the basis of their PhD. Other people might have a PhD, but that just makes up part of their profile because they've got all this work experience. So for those people who applied when sort of master's was the rule um, and were only applying on the basis of the fact they had a master's, those people have already received notifications to say that our requirements changed. So anyone that still, you know, hasn't had a response and is still um, waiting, that means that we're looking at your master's qualification and your um, work experience and we're assessing you kind of on the basis of both. Um, and if you have since completed your PhD, then that's the type of information you would email through to that mailbox to say, hey, since I applied, I've now um, completed my PhD and, you know, here's, here's my updated information. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral research fellow working outside Australia. I am still within three years from my graduation. I feel uh, I fulfill all the eligibility requirements except the salary. I applied four months ago and I still didn't hear. Four months is not too long. Uh, do you think this is due to the low salary? Not necessarily. So again, we recognize that, you know, particularly for people in academia, um, the salaries, are, that, that's quite a high salary to, to achieve. So um, it would be up to you. Um, hopefully you've done this through your expression of interest to explain, I'm in research. This is what our budget sort of looks like. You know, if I were to work in, um, in another industry using the skill set that I have, this might be how much money I would earn. Um, you know, we also have people who are... Um, entrepreneurs, for example. Um, and if you're in a startup, you're generally not paying yourself a really big salary. So those people we also will sort of look at and say, do they, are they not meeting that threshold? Because actually all the money they're earning is going back into the business. So that's a legitimate reason of why they might not meet the threshold. If you, you know, say that you're working in finance or perhaps, um, you know, energy and mining and you don't meet that threshold, then that's a red flag for us, right? Because those are industries that are very well paid. Um, and if you don't meet that threshold, then perhaps you're not senior enough. Um, so, so the salary in of itself is not a red flag, is not a, a sort of, you know, it counts you out, but it is something for us to consider. And we need to look at why it is that you're not quite earning that threshold and, and what that means in the context of what your claims are. And again, I will say again, uh, four months is not a long wait, but to all our clients, like we want to, hold, to help everyone, but guys, if you did an, if you made an application for your EOI yourself and you didn't explain something good enough, um, I'm very sorry to say that, but you might have to, to wait for a certain time until they get back to you, either by saying you're invited to apply for a visa or refusal. 
Um, a, a very, it's very unfortunate, but we're not able to do much in the process because the global talent team would normally respond that we don't, we, we're, we, can, we cannot assist with applications that are in processing. I assume that this is due to the workload they have, as Sarah explained. So I would want to help everyone so much, but um, you know, if you did something wrong, uh, I would say that it's very difficult to update that, fi that file. It's, it's, it's quite difficult to change you can, it. You can update the file. Um, it's certainly better to have had a comprehensive application from the start, but yep. you, can, you can send information through and you can update your file. Um, if, it, if you haven't had a response yet, it means your application hasn't been or your EOI hasn't been assessed yet. Um, but as you say, it can be more difficult. I think it's probably important to note here, this is maybe a good segue, that you can submit multiple EOIs. So if you oh, apply, yeah. submit an EOI and it's sort of rejected, you don't get invited to apply for the visa, you can apply again. Um, and but you need to get the rejection not, first, right? Yes, yes. Okay, that's what I'm saying. And people might be waiting for months for that rejection. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's been 12 months since EOI submission. My situation has changed with PhD completion and many more papers and projects. Do you think I should withdraw the current application and submit a new one? There is no withdrawal, right, Sarah? I mean, you can withdraw it, but you'd basically go back to the end of the queue. So um, what I would do in that situation is email the team and say, since I applied, here is where I've graduated, here's the extra work I've done, and they will add that to your file. And then once um, they're ready to assess it, they'll have all that information there. Um, uh, the question about the salary requirement, uh, I think we've responded to that, sorry, but we still have so many questions and running short of time, so I will go on. Um, I have PhD in civil engineering, which sector is suitable? Uh, I guess it depends on what your PhD specifically is and what it is that you are doing, you know, what sort of work you're doing. So hopefully some of the advice I've given in some of the other responses helps. Um, are you applying that in the resources industry? Are you working in the energy industry? Um, so just thinking about what it is that you're actually doing now with that PhD um, or what specifically you kind of covered within your studies. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, so a, a question again about waiting or updating or whatever. Uh, look, we, we have responded to that already. We can help you, uh, but I think we won't ask Sarah to, to make the decision instead of the decision maker. So you can get in touch uh, with, uh, with our migration agent team and we'll help you with, with your file, with updating and a further explanation on whether this should or shouldn't be done. Um, I was working while doing PhD as full-time both at the same time. How do you evaluate years of experience? So it's, it's the same way. So your PhD is just one component of your exceptional skills. Um, so we'd also be looking at what it is that you have achieved in the workplace. So for some people, you know, the PhD got you to where you are, but actually the exceptional skills that you have is what you have done in your working career since you had your PhD. And that is, you know, effectively becomes um, just a supporting document. Um, so it's really about you putting yourself forward and saying, uh, yes, my PhD got me to, to where I am, but it's these things that I have achieved since I've sort of entered the full-time workforce or, you know, in the workforce while I was also studying. Um, that is what makes me exceptional. Thank you, Sarah. And last question, I have PhD qualification in construction management and more than 12 publications, as well as I have more than eight years of working experience in the construction industry. Can you advise which sector uh, suits my profile? So again, it sort of depends on what you're looking at. Um, one of the industries that we have is infrastructure. So I would encourage you to have a look on our website and look at what that infrastructure sector covers. Um, and and whether you know construction generally would be in infrastructure, but just sort of having a look if what what you've done um, aligns with what we're sort of after in that in infrastructure industry. Okay, and one more question came up. I think I asked this question, but the applicant might have uh, joined us later. 
I got a PhD in computer science from, sorry if I mispronounced that, Tsinghua University, China, 2010. Does PhD outside Australia, uh, is it, does it have less weight compared to an Australian PhD? No, so it's not about um, Australian versus other PhDs, but what we do look at is the ranking of universities across the globe. So a university that's ranked in the top 100, um, you know, that PhD is sort of going to be uh, worth more, I guess, than a, a, a PhD from a, a university that's outside the top 1,000. Um, but uh, we would look at what it is you've done, the quality of the school, the quality of the PhD, and more importantly, what it is specifically that you have studied. Okay, um, I can uh, see that we're running out of time. Sorry, but we're not going to answer any more questions. You can get in touch with us um, if, if you want, and we will discuss your profile in line with the requirements of the um, Global Talent Program. Um, thank you very much, Sarah. This was an amazing presentation, which we all appreciated very much. And I think we've had wonderful engagement with the number of participants um, having grown in the first 10 minutes and stayed the same, we lost only one person during this one hour. It just shows how good it was for, for people and uh, how, how it lived up to their expectations. Thank you very much for that, Sarah. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's always great to have so many people that are interested in Australia. You know, we feel very fortunate and uh, this is a really exciting program and uh, we look forward to kind of hearing from you, Kostya, and, and from the people through you, I guess, um, who are interested in the program and, and getting some real talent into Australia. So thank you everyone for your interest and thank you for having me today. Thank you, Sarah. Sarah Rose, First Secretary, Home Affairs, Global Talent. Europe um, uh, and Israel, Australian High Commission in London. I did it twice again. I, did, I, I, I didn't forget the difficult title, although I was looking at my notes. <laughs> and me, uh, Kostya Kuzmin, registered migration agent um, and Aussies group, um, a team of dedicated professionals. Um, guys, remember that mistakes uh, it's cheaper not to make mistakes in migration. Mm -hmm. That's what I always tell my clients. It's cheaper to have some support and assistance. Sarah, thank you very much again. And uh, we, we'll, we hope very much to have you uh, again with us sometime in the future. Thank you. Sounds great. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.